Hi, you're all very welcome along to LGFA HQ here in Dublin in the shadow of Crow Park. And we are back for the latest in our mini series all about creating a positive club coaching environment. Um, I think we're going to have a bit of fun today. William Harmon is here, National Development Officer with Remit for Coach Education with the LGFA. And I'm also delighted to be joined by Dublin legend Clina O'Connor, goalkeeper on the 2010 TG Cahar all Ireland winning team. Getting for Teens Ambassador, LGFA Coach Developer, and also involved with the Dublin Senior Hurlers. So uh, you're both very welcome. A nice person. And an overall very, very nice person. <laughs> William, not so much. No, he's fine. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, if you're tuning in, um, please do leave your comments underneath the, uh, the comment section on this um, show. If you're listening in, you can email William, William.Harmon, H-A-R-M-O-N, at LGFA.ie. We want to hear your feedback, suggestions, comments, constructive criticism as we go through the show and we're going to have a very specific look at the role of the coach today Tina, and best structures what it's like to coach on the ground because uh, in your role with the Dublin Senior Horrors and we will have a brief chat about that you describe yourself as a freelance a freelance athlete development coach tell us a little bit about it. it's a good a good place to start Tina. Yeah. so at the minute my day job is athlete development coaching which is it's not just GA, it's it's any sport at all. So basically my role is to make sure that that athlete can deliver the requirements for their particular sport. So if they're a tennis player, can they do what they need to do on the court? If they're a GA player, can they cover the ground they need to cover, execute the skills in a performance environment, all of those pieces. So it's making sure that the environment is right around the player and that they have the physical capacities to do what they need to do for their sport. So I suppose that's my general day-to-day -day work. Okay, we obviously know you... Uh, very much so as a former Dublin player of some renown, all-star, all-Ireland winner. Um, the transition, uh, or, or was coaching part of your journey along the way, Clean, or, or has coaching become your journey since playing? What was the... I was always involved in coaching in some capacity. So as a player, as a teenager, I was coaching in camps. I, you know, I didn't. My you were always interested in coaching right from the start. Always interested in coaching. I'd never really had like I never worked a part time job in a bar or anything. I worked summer camps. I worked coach at weekends. So that was always what I did for a bit of cash, you know, growing up. Um, and then when I was coming to the end of my career, I was coaching more, and it started to pick up. And I suppose that was the. It was hard to do both. And maybe that was part of the reason that I I stopped playing because my career in coaching was taken off and you just everything happens at the same time between six and nine, Monday to Friday or Saturday, Sunday morning. So you can't really develop a career in coaching while you're still playing at a high level. It just doesn't work. You don't have the availability. So I was all, uh, definitely always interested in coaching. And it's a shift when you come from being a player to but then being on the sideline. Even if you know your sport very well, even if you're working in the same sport, it's a different skill set. You need to put a different hat on. You need to communicate differently. So it did take a while to to make that transition. And probably for me, one of the good things is that I haven't a lot of the the big jobs I've had uh, have not haven't been with ladies football. Okay. So that little bit of being removed, um, I think, has helped me develop as a coach because it takes you out of that place where well when I was a player I did this or this is you, you can't do that when you're coaching a different sport um, so it, it challenges you in a different way but what are the transferable skills then from from code to code well in terms of coaching athletes it's all the same skills you know it's it's a needs analysis it's what's what are the demands of the game um, measure where the athletes at and then bridge the gap that that's pretty much it and that applies to every sport and every code so it's understanding, the first step in any sport is understanding what the athlete needs to do in that sport. The general physical uh, demands, but then also tactical demands. So what, what does a manager, what does a manager want? Does he want really strong and fast players? Does, is he focusing or she focusing on endurance or wh what type of game plan are they playing and what type of mentality? It's, it's everything really. What, what type of player does the manager want to create? And it's your job to, to help them do that. Yeah, because we hear a lot about that axis between manager and coach. A manager manages the team and a coach coaches the team. And that's a fairly traditional model, you know, just from my own point of view. And looking at, at Tipperary and the hurling teams down through the years, it was Liam Sheedy, Eamon O'Shea, and very, di very distinct manager and a very distinct coach. Um, so Tlina hits a brilliant point there in terms of the coach, William, that, you know, the manager and the coach have to be in sync and, and, and on the same wavelength because... It, if they're not, you've got a problem. 
Yeah, fair point. I think everybody has to be on the same wavelength. I think what we, you know, I think is our third show. Like you know, and what we're kind of really promoting the importance of you know everybody, all the key stakeholders understanding w- what the common goal is and going after it. Same applies to whether a, a group of coaches uh, and their managers, whatever. You know, everybody's sitting on the same hinge to go after the common goal. But I suppose we have to be realistic in a club environment as well. Is that you know you're not going to have you know managers and coaches. You're going to have probably coach. You know, mm. and how do we get more people to support the coach on the ground to do the best job possible? Do you know, and I just want to kind of elaborate there on what Kenny was highlighting about the four demands of the game. I suppose you have the technical aspect, which is your hand pass, your kick pass, tactical awareness of where to run, and physical, obviously, the ability to, to run, jump, and, and catch. And then the other one is the whole area of the psychosocial and emotional side of things, Kenny. Do you feel that? In particular, when you're coaching female sport, and I suppose coaching, I suppose girls, you know. Is which area do you feel that you know coaches need to really kind of you know get a better understanding of in order to I suppose develop players to the best of their ability? You know, from your experience in the club, uh, you know, which which area do you feel you know is one area that you know okay our coaches on the ground need to probably just get a better understanding of uh, of the four key demands. So I think psychosocial obviously is a huge area, but I I want I want to get your thoughts on that uh, in relation to uh, that relationship and that connection with players. I think that's probably the most important one and the, the, the psychosocial bit and the, it's the piece that is most overlooked by coaches and that's potentially at an at a elite level or inter-county and at grassroots level. I think part of the reason is because it's not as tangible for people. You meet coaches and whether it's coach education courses or just general chit-chat and it's always you know drills and games and this and that and, and the question I always ask coaches when you're in the car park before your session and you're there and you're sitting there and you're planning your session what are you, what are you usually doing uh, be it on a, a, a napkin or be it on in your folder or whatever way you do it it's usually where you're going to set out the set out the cones and will it be 10 meters or will it be 20 meters and we put a huge emphasis on the technical and the tactical side and the physical side of things the physical because it's measurable and it's it's very specific but it's the other it's the psychosocial bit that that is the glue that holds it all together and it's the bit that gets people to attend your training sessions. It's like we're talking about community level sport. So th- like we're, that's what we're talking about, community level. So people turning up a couple of times a week to their local club, if they don't like the environment, if it's not, if it doesn't make them feel good about themselves, if they don't feel a connection to their team, they're not going to come, regardless of whether your cones are 10 metres or 20 metres apart. They're not going to come. And I'm not sure we plan enough for that element or we pay enough attention to well what am I actually doing here in terms of fostering that sort of connection to to a place in the community and to within a team and when you get that right I think it's that's the magic and yeah. the really good coaches that you hear about or um, at club level or they seem to do that it's just in their personality they just have it and and people you can always tell when people talk about coaches that have that they talk about them with such such warmth and such love and such positivity that these people made them feel good and you know, just that point and I, I'm just going to bring it back to the club and how does that look like in the club and I was like, well, how do we develop that and I, would, I know I was uh, in a course recently and one of the coaches gave a, a bit of a, a bit of feedback on what they were doing they were saying this well, they understand the importance of uh, and Liz highlighted in the last show regarding you know, being with their friends and, and that social aspect and you know girls are always chatting and talking and stuff and, and what they did was they had um, you know a chat time so if session was starting at half seven you know the chat time is from quarter past seven to half past seven so it's an opportunity for the girls to mingle interact and chat or even coach on the ground uh, during a session might do instead of having water it's chat time you know so mm-hmm. again promoting that whole aspect of you know it's time you, know, you, you can interact and because they understand the importance of the social element in relation to our game um, and even saying hello would, would you mm. would you kind of connect with that or what's your thoughts on in terms of that developing that so how, how can we do that I suppose on the ground what simplistic things can we do really do you know? well, I think that's a really good idea and from a coach's perspective see part of the problem is we're all taking coaching seriously and, I, and at club level people really want to do a good job and like I take my coaching really seriously and I fell into the trap for a long time thinking that in order to do a, a good proper job if the session was seven to eight like I had to coach and coach kind of hard from seven to eight and make sure they got their value out of it and all and take you know set high standards and all that which is all fine but I you don't have to do that you, you know I think I felt under pressure I have to jam as much into this as possible all that technical tactical physical stuff but then I realised, you know what, 
if you get if you get people comfortable and set the tone and set that environment for 10 minutes at the start or 10 minutes in you'll get more out of that 45 50 minutes in the middle because people will feel better and again understanding that if you want to draw people up every week and make it somewhere where people want to be you have to connect with them at a human level and you have to allow them time to connect with each other yeah. and not be it's it shouldn't be like a drill sergeant type yeah. uh, environment you know but Tina, i suppose i'm going to challenge i suppose because there are a lot of coaches and uh, and they want to do that. They want to connect with players. They want to create a positive environment. They want to people to enjoy. You can enjoy yourself being competitive too, you know. Mm. But are, is there a lot of coaches? And I, just from your experience getting in the club, is there a lot of coaches on the ground whereby they're probably, I don't know, probably blinded by this whole thing of success? And, and listen, Joe, you know what we have to win the championship. We have to win the next game. We have to win the next league game. And because of that pressure, or maybe someone else looking over their shoulder, going, "Listen, if you don't win, you're not a good coach." Do, does that kind of you know blur the lines a small bit? In terms, does that allow a coach be the best can be if there's these other pressures going on? You know, that, where uh, I, I yeah. don't know. That, I just want to throw it out there that I'm sure there's a lot of coaches right. out there who would love to probably develop mm. all these areas. But you know what? If we don't, it's all about results, and I don't care. That's that's what they say. You know, oh geez, we don't win. Well, I'm not deemed successful, and I might be bought back next year. So how do we kind of get that balance in terms of? You know, making sure we can create a positive environment, but also mm. try and be successful where we can be mm. as well. Well, you're right. Like, I'm outrageously competitive. You know, and outrageously competitive as a coach. And at times, it's it's a hard line to to walk between between that and not to get caught up in the short term goals of uh, we have to do whatever it takes to win this match at the weekend versus long term the d- long term development of your players. So it and and. Let's call a space play. Being a GAA coach on the sidelines is often a really bloody hard thing to do because the only thing we measure, and sport is competitive, sport is based on results. You win or you lose, you, or you draw, and then it's a replay or whatever. But you win or you lose, it's black or white. Um, so, like, if that's the only way we measure our coaches, then we're setting whatever ninety five percent up for them of them up for failure all the time because they all can't win. So we have to put a language and a structure around well what else is meaningful in terms of success. And as coaches, we have to stop putting each other under pressure. Because we do that in GAA clubs. You know, we, we, we do it all the time. We everybody's ambitious. Everyone wants to win. But there has to be some level of reality and that we have to balance that with okay, we didn't win, but what did we do? And success looks so much different. In different teams, H- hugely, yeah. You know, success for one is is may not necessarily mean success for another. So uh, you talk about the measures, though, clean. I mean, I, I would assume, for you know, talking to you guys from the outside looking in, in, in many ways, is that maybe your only measure is anecdotal. In that, the player will turn around and say to you, "You've made me a better player." Cleaner, you've made me a better player. Thanks for your work. Mm. I mean, you, you, it, it's very difficult to measure whether a player has become a better player or not. M- maybe you have s- mm. you use certain stats in terms of maybe ground covered or you know points scored, wh- wh- whatever whatever the measures are. But I would I, I would say you know I think it's a very interesting conversation that you're having. I think f- my own view on it is that success is m- should be measured by the enjoyment that the player is gaining, whether he or she feels he or she is becoming a better player. Mm. And if that's happening and it's collective and it's collective and all the players are coming together and becoming better, well then obviously the chances of, of success are, are going, well, to, going to be higher. I'm, I'm going to give you a really honest answer to, to that now. Um, so m- I'm, my club is Neighbourne Oak in, in Port Marnock, North Dublin. And we didn't have a ladies team for a year or two. We, we started a senior team last year and I was coaching and, pl- and playing a little bit. Um, and there was a broad spectrum of players on the team. We had um, a couple returning from a, uh, a couple of years break. We had young players coming through. We had in their, a group in their maybe mid, mid-20s, early 20s. So it was a big, broad spectrum. So year one, the goal was get it up and running again, get as many people back playing. You know, we just had to start, get it started. So we did that and we did relatively well. You know, we kind of finished mid, mid-table in the league. Um, I think we got to a championship semi-final or quarter-final. You know, so team went up and running. It was it was a good start. Now, the message or what I was trying to create in the club was like, this is your team. This is now an adult team. It's not a juvenile team. It's your team. You sort of set the tone of it and us, the coaches, will meet you where 
you're at. You know, if you want a recreational team where you don't really care about winning, we'll train in that manner. If you want to be more ambitious, we'll train in that manner. You know, whatever it is you want to do. So, yeah, I would say, generally speaking, from a football point of view, it, it went it went well. Now, here's, here's something that I reflected on like, the last week or two. There was a, a fundraiser in the club a couple of weeks ago for the ladies' section, um, and a disco bingo or something, and a night in the club. And the club had been really, really supportive of the new ladies' team throughout the season, and we got pretty much anything we asked for, and we didn't ask for much, you know, but we, we got what we, want, we needed. None of that adult team went to that night in the club. None of them showed up for it. It was, a, it was a thing for the ladies' team. Now, to me, that's a much bigger issue. And that's a much bigger reflection on that team and where they're at and the mentality and the environment we created that that wasn't a priority. They didn't feel... And it's not a... a you know, they're not bad people for showing up, but they, they didn't want to... It wasn't a priority for them to go up. Why? I don't know. Because obviously it wasn't the the team isn't connected enough that it was listen here's a here's a night out in the club um, let's all go up there and make the effort and socialise together them none of them so there was uh, mentors and from other teams and all of that type of stuff and the Gaelic from others group there was some of those in it but and that's not a criticism of the players it's a criticism of the what we achieved this year do you know what I mean so the, the, again community level club we've got a great clubhouse in Navernog a great bar there was a night put on the club it was going to be entertaining all of that and it, it wasn't appealing for them to be there so to me that, that's a problem for us that, that night should have been appealing for that team to go up and that's the piece at club level that we're missing I think you know I, I would like to create a team where they'd be delighted they were like absolutely we're not missing that night let's go up and and the club together and the section together and make it a good night out for the ladies section and earn a bit of uh, fundraising for the section that's a good point yeah. and let's come back to um, what Liz said you know in the last show regarding I suppose understanding our players better and mm. connecting more do you feel because that you know maybe that that question needs to be asked well, well why, why why didn't she you know connect why what 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 can we do better? Yeah. Do you feel that's something we need to do more as, as coaches and as clubs to say, to actually ask our key stakeholders, listen guys, why did this not happen? Or what do we need to do differently? Would, would you feel that's something that we need to start doing a lot more of, Kleena, and probably not presuming or assuming and probably just ask the question, what, what is it we need to do differently? And then adapt what we need to do to, to meet their needs. Maybe, maybe they just didn't connect or maybe they didn't feel connected. I, I don't know, I just yeah, well, I'm, well, I'm asking that question. I'm, yeah. you know, it's well, just asking when I, what is why let's you know? well I think for that type of thing we have to um, hand it back to the players a little bit um, and give them the the responsibility to do it and and if they don't have the capacity to take the to take those leadership roles we have to build that like make it easy for them to develop a better team you know and you can't force people and that's that's part of the thing as well like you can't you know force people to not force them to like each other, but, you know, kind of make it a contrived scenario. You, you have to let it happen organically. So, in my opinion, next year with this team, it will be, okay, how do we how do we develop that, that social aspect of this team? And what do you want to do? Like, I couldn't care less what the activity is, or I would rather them organise it and them run it themselves than me saying, oh, well, we're going to do this and you have to all show up. And I think that's a good point. I think it's going back to what we're trying to achieve here, the bigger picture. The bigger picture is how do we keep more players involved in our and game. And the overall theme of this is, yeah. is create a positive... A positive coaching, positive coaching environment. environment. So, you know, what do we need to start doing differently? And I think that's, in, that's an interesting point. Like, in, we, in we can, yeah. with, for that example, like, we can absolutely train hard and, and work on skills and get ourselves fitter and all of that type of stuff. But none of that ever works if you don't have that other piece. It so just doesn't cool. work, yeah. you know? But, but, but Lena, knowing you as, as I do for the last few years, I can guarantee you that what happened that night now has just been probably cons consuming your, your mind. <laughs> and you're, you're just flooded with questions. <laughs> But, but I think, you know, yeah. and, and not w yeah. not wishing to dwell on it because yeah. obviously yeah. you've you've revealed something there and it's uh, it's th there's huge honesty in what you've yeah. said. Yeah. But I suppose try you're trying to get the yeah, well, get to the bottom of it in, in well, many that's ways. That's our job as coaches. You know, that's our job is to support and create something that players want to be there. If if my players if my players do not want to go to the club for the one night out for the ladies' football section, then I'm like. 
geez, where did we go wrong there now? Why didn't that work? But Kleena, because you're, we making, you're making a good point, but I, I, I suppose I suppose we as coaches, I, I like coaches are watching to hear, uh, watching the shows, you guys say, well, how much do we actually look at ourselves in relation to that? Sometimes yeah. we, we blame, it's the weather, mm. it's the boots, it's the ref, yeah, it's the club, it's, you know, yeah. I think sometimes we have to start looking at ourselves. And I think that's for yourself. And I can see it inside you. And I'm sure you're kind of going, well, what is it I need to do better? What is yeah. it I need to do? Jeez, that didn't happen. Well, what what could we have done better? And I think that's what we're trying to get at. In order to be better at what you're going to do, yeah. you got to continue to think and reflect. Plan, think and reflect on, on what you're doing. Mm. And if you keep looking at yourself first, I think you're, you're on a winner. And I think that's a big learning point here is that, but, you but know, but why? But that's, like, that's you know, the essence of it. So person. I'm actually not blaming the players. No, exactly. I'm, I'm saying, well... Jeez, well, we didn't get we didn't get something right as coaches, and and am I the right person to coach this team? Maybe I'm not. Am I too serious? Am I, you know, do do we need other um, other personalities? In exactly. There, you know? No, and I just want to move on. You, you had a very good point there. If you don't mind me, just pick you up a point here. Say about you know about being the right person. I think you are the right person, Kleena. You know what I mean? Like you know, I think you are. Um, <laughs> but in terms of matching coaches to certain age groups yeah. and I suppose that's just something I'd like to throw to you as well in terms of and get your thoughts on that and also I suppose having that support for those coaches whoever's delivering because I know a lot of clubs out there that you know in terms of you know they're struggling for people to get involved and to coach and when we speak about I think our research shows internally we did a bit of research internally with our own players and just asked them we just asked them and I think one of the key reasons why they like being involved in ladies football is because they want to improve and get better they want to improve and get better but I think for that to happen you need to have coaches that you know you know, I suppose connect and develop uh, players. So I suppose just look at that whole area of you know matching the coaches to the right age group, and also how do we support our coaches? That it's not just one coach or they're on their own or left there. I'd like to get your thoughts on those two aspects, if you don't mind, clean in terms of number one, matching the coaches to the right age group, which is vitally important, and having the common goal. And number two, in terms of well, how do we get past this kind of idea of getting more people involved in the sport and the coaches on the ground? Um, yeah, so just your thoughts. Oh. I think the first question about matching the coaches to the age groups is really important. Um, it's very different coaching under nines versus under 15s versus an adult team. Mm. It's the same sport, absolutely, but the communication level is so different. Um, I spent three weeks, uh, again, in Nave Marnoag, we, we revamped our nursery a while ago and we developed all these new resources for coaches and structure and trying to put a structure on it because the numbers are growing at a huge rate. We need, we need to get a handle on this so it runs efficiently. So <laughs> I uh, spent all this time making these resources and putting them out to coaches and all that. And then I spent three weeks coaching in the nursery. Holy, like it's mayhem. It's absolutely chaotic, absolutely chaotic. And some of the things that I had on those pieces of paper that I thought, oh, this would be fine. It was like out the window, never going to work yeah, yeah. with five-year-olds, 10 of them looking at you and, you know fixing their nappies or whatever they're doing you know it's just not going to happen so and it's a it's a very different you have to be a very different person down at that level then mm. you've got under 11s and 12s and there's all other things going on there then you've got 15 16 year olds that you know it's it's, it's all just so different and i find when you're moving through those age groups and like i'll often move out over a couple of months i'll end up coaching a few different age groups and you feel how you step into different roles, trying to fit, trying to, you're trying to be a bit of a chameleon, really, because you have to give the that age group what they need. You have to be a bit of a clown for the under eights or whatever. Well, you, maybe you have to be a bit of a clown all the time. But, but <laughs> you, you, do you know what I'm getting at? So you have to adapt to the age groups. They're very, very different. And some people will be better at particular age groups. And that's just because of their personality. But what usually happens in clubs is you start at, under eights and you go all the way through with the same group no matter whether you're good or bad with that particular age group and and you probably pull out all your best skills in the first couple of years all your best tricks and then maybe you run out of new ideas i don't think i could spend 10 or 12 years coaching the same team i think i'd find that exceptionally difficult but that's the reality of what we're asking or that's the norm in clubs that people spend years and years with the same group just just to, you you brought back a great story on that point um I remember talking to Brendan Cummins a few years ago. He was actually uh, writing his book at the time, and he he, he talked about uh, he'd won an All-Ireland, or, or a big game, I think it was, on the Sunday, and he went back to the local club down in Ballybacon on the Tuesday night, and he was coaching under sixes. 
and uh, do you know he had all the drills organised he was like you know, get into there get into there get into there and he spotted a couple of them after a while and they were they were jabbing their hurls into the ground and from afar you might think they were trying to jab lift yeah. or something like that but one of them was after finding a worm <laughs> so they were all just gone over to this little area they con- you know so it's just it's uh, it's, it's reality like they don't that, care about your drills yeah, they're just exactly. looking at the worm but I had a question that kind of there's so much stuff that kind of just when, when you're talking comes up um, you obviously have your way of coaching and you have your way of coaching right? and would you consider yourself pretty steadfast and set in your ways or would you be open to like for example has there been something you've ever seen where you thought that's not going to work but it actually does work and you're like okay I can, I can accept that I didn't think it would work but it did work so I'm going to use it or, or, or you know or do, do, is that a case that your philosophy it, it, it matures and changes and evolves with time I, I, I think yeah yeah I think your your philosophy and value it changes this time because coaching changes it evolves so therefore you as a coach need to evolve with it you know what I mean so mm-hmm. you may have one I, ideal of coaching 10 years ago where I have no problem saying how I coached 10 years ago and how I coach now or chocolate and cheese Chalk and cheese, because just from the learning and understanding. But I, I, I just think it goes back to the key point of understanding your players and just connecting with your players and involving and connecting. I, I just think involving your players and what you're doing. Before, I was very much telling, go here, go there, go over there. I was probably talking for the majority of the session, whereby now maybe my talking is a bit less uh, and I'm probably involving the qu- uh, players more by just getting them involved. Well, what are we trying to do here? Why are we doing this? And I think with girls' football and, and ladies' football, I think girls want to know why. Why you're doing something. You know, in men's football, I don't know, I, I could be wrong here. If you tell the fella to, you know, run up the hill, run down 25 times, he'll do it. He'll never ask why. Well, if you ask a lady to do that or a female player, she might be go, before I do it now, why am I doing this? So you've got to understand, you know what I mean, I suppose, understanding why, and I think they'll ask why more. So uh, I think that was a big challenge for me in terms of, you know, coaching boys and girls is probably getting a better understanding what it is that I'm trying to achieve and have a clarity on that, you know. You're talking about your philosophy changing and, and it, it, you definitely evolve over time if you're, if you're learning and you're an open coach and you're, try, you're trying to be better all the time and add new things to your tool belt. Um, I think the most important thing is that you don't, try and be somebody you're not so I might see I see how William coaches all the time I can't coach the way William coaches I can only coach the way I coach and I think sometimes people see somebody else and they see well I have to take all of that bit well you don't have to you have to take the bit that works for you that helps you be better and there are definitely times when again I see William doing something and I think well and I know where he's trying to get to and I'm like I wouldn't do it that way now I'd do it some way else but in the end he gets to the goal in a different way that, than I would. And if I did, if I had the same uh, aim for my session and delivered it at the same time frame, it might take a different journey, but we'd end up in so the same spot. The same because we all have to bring our own personality to it. And that's one of the most important things for coaches, understanding how you communicate, who you are, what type of coach you are, and then being okay with that and de- obviously developing that and trying to be better all the time and all of that but but you can't be something you're not you have to be your own personality yeah, and just come back to the point about you know the, 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 the example you gave you know and i suppose brendan i suppose had all everything planned in, in, in his head you know i have all this sorted i know how many kids are going to have you know how there's this going to there's a real eye open yeah. and then like you know he's then he goes out and delivers and what he's delivering oh my god is totally different to what he'd planned. However, I'd like to think that a coach who has planned would be able to adapt a, a bit better because in their head they've thought about what they're trying to do, but in reality it doesn't work out. But if you plan something, I'd like to think you can adapt a bit easier, whereby if you go down and didn't plan at all, you would be totally zoomed. So I think, you know, I, I they say a player might know you've planned, but they know after three seconds or four, three or four minutes if they yeah. hadn't planned. You know, and yeah. I just think that, that kind of you know, point coming from there as well, I think Brendan would have probably coped mm. okay because he's going, okay, right, this is definitely mm. not what I planned. But I, ha- I have a picture in my mind how it could work and you just adapt. And then you just think and reflect after the garden and then you just, next time he comes back, I can guarantee you, he won't do the same thing twice. You know, But I think yeah. um, what, what I pick up all the time out doing coach development work and all that is that the standard of preparation and all of that stuff is, is getting better at grassroots level without a shadow of a doubt. Um, but in terms of recruiting and having a good coaching environment, there's possibly a piece we're missing. We're st- there still, even if the coach is, is planned and, and all that attention to detail, there are times when 
the reality is it's one one father and more often than not it's a father coaching a group of 30 or a group of 20 in, in a club and I think we need to get more people involved I think we need to support coaches better again I had a conversation with someone yesterday about uh, putting together a coaching team and they said uh, well, like, we should we need to get a female involved as one mother and I'm going to ask her will she be the FLO the female liaison officer and I was like well why don't you just ask her if she'd be a coach why does she have to be an FLO Oh, I never thought about that, you know. So we say we want to get more women involved in coaching, which I think is correct, especially the teenagers, um, our teenage teams, definitely, 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 um, in terms of the understanding that a female can bring to, to a young teenage girl. Um, that That's really important. And in some some capacity, I think the I'd love to see the, the FLO role be defunct. You know that we just have female coaches. You don't. You're not a net, like. What is that? Oh, I just have to be around in case anyone has female issues. You know. I think that we we should be moving beyond that now. And Joe, in the, in the next show, I think we're going to go into a bit more detail in the next show because we're going to look at communication, effective communication. Mm. I think we're going to look at how that you know that area of how we get more coaches involved in terms of how to communicate the right mm. message in the club in terms of you know. Listen, we want the best coaches coaching our players. Whether it be male or female, one of the best coaches, and if we get more female, we'll go after that. When we'll look about, you know, the next show in terms of uh, well, how do we communicate in the club as coaches, you know, and how do we ensure that everybody's developing to the stage that they, that they should be developing? So I'm looking forward to those con- uh, um, conversations. But Clean, thank you very much. I really, you know, really enjoyed the chat, and you know, but I just think at the end of the day, uh, as coaches, we probably just need to understand why our players are coming in the gate and, and how we connect with them, you know, and creating a culture that you know what we're here. To, to learn and develop and be the best we can be. But also understand that, you know what, not everything's going to go right all the time, you know. And I think that's... It's uh, definitely not. There's a reality. <laughs> <laughs> there's a reality there. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. But, um, yeah. So, yeah, it's good. thank you very much. Yeah. Good stuff. No, that was a great chat. We could, we could spend another hour here easily. Um, but, you know, we, we've, we, we've scratched the surface. I think, this, uh, you know, really listen cool. to you guys. There's, yeah. there's so much... Um, more we could have talked about there but uh, the clock is always our enemy in, in these cases so uh, Clean O'Connor thanks a lot for coming in a freelance athlete development coach and a very very good one at that Gaelic for Teens ambassador LGFA coach developer an all round nice person thank you very <laughs> much Clean and William Harmon national development officer with Remit for coach education good guy as well <laughs> thanks William um, please folks uh, to help us move forward with these shows we need your feedback your comments your, your suggestions um, do you like the show do you not like the show um, all all feedback is welcome uh, on the comment section on the various social media posts and also William.Harmon H-A-R-M-O-N at LGFA.ie so as William uh, said we'll be back our next show looking at the whole concept of effective communication as we build towards a positive coaching environment right across the country and beyond. Thanks for watching. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.